Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Almost. Uh, so mm -hmm. let's get started. I'm Ben Lifshitz. So I'm excited to host a visitor from Adobe in San Francisco visiting us for the day. Uh, he'll talk about um, uh, type inference for dynamically typed languages, uh, Avic. The podium is yours. All right, thanks. And by the way, if you want to talk to Avic one-on-one, uh, uh, -on -one, we still have, I think, a slot or two somewhere and some, sometime in the afternoon. Right. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, just a brief uh, introduction on uh, who I am. Um, so I wear various hats at Adobe. One of the hats is um, designing ActionScript 4, which is the next version of uh, ActionScript. ActionScript is a language that analyzes Flash applications. Uh, and this was uh, part of a larger refocus of, of Flash towards uh, gaming. So Flash was traditionally targeted towards ads, but now uh, we want to focus uh, ourselves towards game programming. And uh, ActionScript 4 uh, went a long way to, to achieve that with a cleaner and richer type system and faster bytecodes. Um, uh, so we are recently more interested in JavaScript. Uh, and this is, again, part of a larger effort to advance the web. Uh, it, this, in particular, means that uh, I've been uh, starting to get involved in uh, TC39, which is the JavaScript design committee. And we're thinking of adding various kinds of features to JavaScript to make it better. Uh, such as concurrency. I'm also interested in all sorts of optimizations that you can do um, in, in compiling JavaScript. But this, the, the second part is fairly new. Uh, we're just getting started there. Uh, in this talk, we, uh, I'm going to focus on um, type inference. Now, type inference means uh, very different things to very different people. Um, one theme that I want to focus on in this talk is uh, the kind of techniques that will allow you to describe rather than prescribe behaviors. So we're not trying to enforce a very st strict discipline on, on code. Uh, instead, we're going to take code as it is and try to uh, gain uh, information about that code, um, in particular to, to make it, uh, you know, use, that, use that information for various uh, purposes like uh, performance optimization, security analysis, and so on. Also, maybe just to understand the program better. Um, so if you think about why people write dynamically typed code, uh, there are at least two reasons. And sometimes the same piece of code can, can manifest both reasons. One is just to avoid verbosity, right? Java-like verbosity. So you're doing something that's fairly simple, uh, but you don't want to write down types every time you, you, you um, come back from a function or, or declare a variable and so on. Um, the other one is where uh, you want to avoid rigidity in the type system. So in the first case, you are, you are writing implicitly typed code, but you just don't want to write down types. In the second class of uh, programs, you, you are actually trying very hard to get around the type system because the type system is getting in your way. right? So if you, if you don't have generics in your, uh, in your system, either you write multiple versions of typed code or you use the dynamic type uh, and, and you get around the type system. If you have generics but not dependent types, maybe you want to do, uh, again, go, go out of the type system. So the dynamic type offers you kind of an escape hatch uh, to write programs that would otherwise be inexpre inexpressible in your type system. So. Um, Going, going along the, uh, that, uh, you know, this intuition, we really have at least two problems. Uh, one problem is um, when you are given uh, implicitly typed code, and I, I would call this kind of code the good code, um, you, you don't have types in there, but, but it's still implicitly typed. Uh, can I make it run faster without, without breaking the program? So you have the program, you're not trying to, you know, uh, change it anyway. You just want to, you know, get some information to run it faster. Uh, so this uh, is based on a paper that was published in Popple 2012, joint work with uh, Asim Rastogi and Basil Hosmer. Uh, and the second line of work, I'll, I'll discuss uh, a technique where you you are given explicitly untyped code, uh, highly dynamic code, and I'll call this code the bad code. Although I'm not passing judgment, right? I just gave you very good reasons why you would want to write such code. Uh, it's, it's bad just because it, it breaks most traditional static analysis. 
given such code can i discover types by observing it as as it runs uh, as it runs so so i'm going to throw some some dynamic analysis at this problem and this is based on an earlier paper that we published in popel 2011 this joint work with uh, david and jeff foster and mike hicks all right static analysis beautiful world uh why do we want uh um so so the motivation behind this uh, this this line of work is is this whole buzz around uh, script to program ev uh, evolution um so the idea is that you start off with a dynamically typed script and by script i mean just anything that you, that you've just you know written down fairly fast for for prototyping purposes and then uh then this this uh, this script needs to be uh, gradually uh, moved into a, a a program a program is something that you want to maintain for a long time and it has to be robust and performant and so on and there's this thing called gradual typing that that many people advocate uh, which is uh, really just incrementally adding types to your program and as you incrementally type you you get more checking and you get more uh, uh, more guarantees uh, that's the hope at least uh so so adding annotations would give you more performance that's the that's the promise of gradual typing now in our in our experience this is more or less a fantasy uh and we have a lot of experience in this domain uh action script is a a production uh gradually typed language uh and it's used by millions of people and really they 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 don't use it uh in in this in this uh manner they either write scripts or they write programs um uh, and uh, you know it's it's unfortunate because this this whole uh, story uh, actually makes sense but but nobody uses it why doesn't uh, anybody use it uh, if you think about it there's a there's an annoying trade off that you are pro uh, providing uh, programmers with you either annotate your program which means you have to take on a lot of burden or if you don't you get a performance penalty and uh, people choose choose what they want and they go with either one or the other um uh, and they don't get uh you know get rid of uh, both at the same time and that's the problem so the problem is that if you leave out a type annotation uh the compiler thinks that you really want a dynamic type so missing annotation the dynamic types were default although what you really meant was that a dynamic type has to be there as a fallback uh and and most of the time you're not uh writing dynamic type code you're writing static type code but implicitly statically typed. Okay. Yeah. So if you have a tracing jit though, won't you be able to get rid much of much of the performance penalty if you don't make that assumption? Right? If you just trace through the code and recover like the types and have full back plans for other things. Yes, you you get part of the way there. I would claim. Uh case. yeah, and uh, if you if you're trying to discover types at runtime and we'll go into this you know most of the time you are you are uh, you are getting local information and not getting uh, you know uh, cross cross function um, opportunities and so yeah is performance really the the i can see performance as being one of the main uh, concerns here but uh, isn't it also a question of you know maintaining code and being able to yes uh, have modularity of course a large team of course all all the all the you know cite all the all the good uh, you know arguments for static typing and i'm with you but if if you have to really sell it you know talk performance and and this idea immediately sells right uh, people are sometimes you know most developers are are okay with with working hard to to write you know badly written code but if they can get some performance out of of doing something then that's that's some much larger motivation for them to try something out so is that the big okay. carrot at adobe to get people to annotate their stuff with oh yeah 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 i mean especially because there's a lot of low hanging fruit in there action script 3 is not not very performant so if you if you if you dangle that carrot they they may get okay uh so we're going to talk about gradual type inference then uh practical motivation is to improve the performance of existing flash applications um by eliminating as many type casts as possible um uh, and one of the key goals in this work which is important because this this drives what what techniques we are going to use is that we want to be backward compatible which means that we cannot recompile a program and have it break in arbitrary context and so on uh a non goal is to increase safety or eliminate errors uh which means that 
Yes, we can, of course, reject programs. So maybe this is a uh, very, very uh, too harsh uh, a statement. But we definitely don't want to fail early or, or you know, pull up checks uh, in, in places that, you know, uh, if, if, we, if we are not guaranteed to fail, we should not fail, right? So this is, this is a very different kind of uh, modality than, than, uh, than, the, than the usual way of thinking about typing, which is uh, you conservatively prove that, that, you know, you may fail and, and you reject a program. And this is because we, we, we should admit a code that is reasoning outside the static type system. Otherwise, we will be solving a different problem than what people require. So here's, uh, here's an example of a gradually typed program. Uh, you can see some annotations and some missing annotations. And by default, uh, these, these uh, missing annotations are, are uh, taken to be the dynamic type, which are denoted by star here. Now what that does is it, uh, so how, if you think about it, how, how is a dynamically typed value represented at runtime? It, it, is, it is represented with a type tag. So, it's, uh, it, so you, you do a lot of boxing and unboxing all over the place. Uh, so, so here zero was, was upcast uh, from number to star, which, which is, is uh, what, what you would call boxing in most compilers. Um, and you also have the opposite downcast, which is unboxing. And typically, some, some operation may, may involve a whole lot of boxing and unboxing. So this is the kind of byte code that an action script compiler will generate. Um, and this, this you, you pay heavily um, for, for this. Of course, a JIT, uh, as, as Ben observed, would, would typically take out some of these, but not, uh, not all. Uh, so instead of uh, assuming that a missing type is a dynamic type, uh, what we do here is that we, we assume that it's an unknown type. So we, we invent type variables. I, I uh, represent type variables with capital letters here, uh, italics. Um, and we will try to infer static types for these unknown types uh, where possible, although the, the dynamic type is, is perfectly fine as well as a solution. So, so we cannot type a certain part of the program. We will not reject it. We will just give it the dynamic type. So, so we won't be worse off than, than what we were before. But hopefully, we will be much better. So this is the architecture of, of the system. You, you start off with a program annotated with type variables, and these type variables are obviously auto-generated. Uh, there's a compilation phase that, that translates this program to a program with coercions. These coercions are just like um, you know, typecast that a compiler would insert uh, for you, uh, except that in this case, they, they also have type variables in there. And next, we, we interpret these coercions as, as uh, small you know, flow constraints. And we do a closure computation on, on top of these flow constraints to get a flow relation. And then we s solve this relation. We get, down, uh, get, get back solutions for these type variables. We plug back the solutions in the coercions. So you get concrete coercions, and then you can eliminate many of these coercions. Okay. Okay. So this is the notation I'm going to use for a coercion, uh, t1 to t2. This this essentially means that I have a term of type t1 that is flowing into a context that expects a term of type t2. Okay. And uh, I will distinguish two kinds of um, constraints. One uh, kind of constraints are uh, you know constraints that are flowing into a type variable which I would call inflows, and uh, the opposite one would be outflows. And again, I want to distinguish between the two, uh, these two because they are going to uh, determine how we solve for uh, these variables. Okay. So, uh, so instead of star, now I'm going to generate uh, you know, coercions to type variables and coercions from type variables, right? Uh, so this is, uh, you know, these are the coercions that I'll generate. This is completely trivial. Um, now, um, again, looking at a type variable, you will have a whole bunch of things that are flowing in and a whole bunch of things that are flowing out of that type variable. Uh, so how do typical type inference algorithms work? Uh, you, you, have, you see what is flowing into a type variable, and that determines all the things that uh, that, that variable can contain, right? So these are the definitions of, of the type variable. And if you take a least upper bound of, of, of these um, types, then you get some sort of tight bound on what that variable can contain, uh, how, how it is defined. If you look at the outflows, on the other hand, if, if you take a greatest lower bound or intersection of all, all the places where the type variable flows out, 
uh, essentially you're talking about how that variable is used in your program. So you're talking about safety there. Um, and typically your solution is somewhere in between uh, this, this least upper bound and greatest lower bound. Uh, and if you have uh, you know, certain well-defined de well uh, type variables, sometimes uh, you, uh, the, the solution is fairly trivial. It's either this or that. But some other type variables may have ambiguous polarities, and, and uh, you, you can't decide which one to use. Sometimes these, these bounds will even cross over, which means that something funny is going on in a program. Uh, your program may not be completely wrong, but, but it, it may involve reasoning outside the type system, so on. Anyway, so we, we just uh, said that the theme here would be to describe and not prescribe behaviors. Uh, so we will focus on least upper bounds here uh, because we want to define exactly uh, what the tightest representation for a, for a type variable is. So that's going to determine our solutions. So as applied to the simple, simple example, uh, if, you, if you look at the inflows into S, there's just one, so S is number. Um, Two things flow into i, if you take their union, it's still number. Um, one thing flows into the return type of this function, uh, and that's also number. So uh, we ignore the outflows, but, um, but that, that, that was not entirely necessary in this. Uh, it's, it's not important in this example, but, but just to note that we did ignore all the outflows. Uh, so you, yeah. Was the bang significant in foo? That's just notation. So uh, we, we're using the notation foo bang to, to uh, denote the return type of the foo function. Uh, we'll also use foo question mark to denote the, the parameter type of foo. It, the, it's not significant. It's, it's just, just a name, naming convention. So uh, we get this program now once we insert all the, all, the type, uh, all the solutions in. And you can see a lot of redundant stuff here, right? So number to number coercions can be eliminated. So we end up with this program. Uh, uh, and, and that's much, uh, much simpler than, than the original program, that, uh, the compiled program that we had earlier. Okay. Uh, so, so this is a key idea. Only inflows determine solutions in the system. And this is precisely because we want, want our, um, want our uh, type inference to be backward compatible. We don't want to uh, you know, uh, uh, do early errors. And you'll see uh, uh, why I'm saying this in, in more examples later. So uh, how does type inference for higher, higher order types work? Uh, ActionScript is a dialect of uh, JavaScript, so you have uh, first class functions flying around all over the place. So this is uh, kind of a simple example that, that is, is indicative of larger uh, examples, where you have a function that, that takes anything um, and, and I uh, assign it to a variable called x. And under some condition, I, I override this, this uh, function with something that is more specialized. It takes an int. And I can call it with integers in that context. But other, in other contexts, I can, I can call it with uh, things that are not ints, uh, for example, doubles. Okay. So if, we, if I proceed as, as before, I'll uh, generate two coercions here. Start to void goes to x, and into void goes to x. These are the two kinds of functions that are flowing into x. Um, and if you're doing a kind of a traditional static type inference, uh, you would, uh, because we are interested in taking the lower bounds, uh, greatest lower bound of, of the things that are flowing into x, and the, um, sorry, did I say, I should have said least upper bound, sorry. Um, and the least upper bound for functions is defined as the greatest lower bound of, of the parameter types arrow the least upper bound of the return types, right? The polarities switch uh, at the parameter side. So that's how I get into void. But uh, it, this is completely unsound in, in, in the definition of unsound that we have, right? Because it's going to break the program. Um, it's, it's going to break the program because now, uh, you know, uh, what, what happens to this call where, where you, I'm, I'm passing in a double uh, to this x? Uh, so then you would think, oh, I'm doing something wrong, so maybe I should just take the union of, of parameter types. And, and infer x to be start to void. But this doesn't make sense. It may work for this example, but it makes me nervous, right? Why do you do that? Yep. I didn't understand something. You said uh, uh, break the program at, at this call uh, when you call x with, a, with 0.42. Um, I mean, the inferred types, how do they manifest themselves? Are they, are they inserted into the program as runtime type tests? Uh, you, would, you would start assuming that x uh, would only hold functions that uh, expect ints, and therefore you might you might use this information to to convert things early to ints and so on, right? 
So, so the fact that you are inferring this type would, would then mean that the compiler is free to, free to treat x as a function, uh, as holding functions that take in two words. And who, know, who knows what it might do with that information, right? It might, it might wrap around that, that, that function with, with an with a early conversion to int, for example. And that would be completely wrong, because then this, this double would be converted to an int before, before being passed into the original function. But you're talking about runtime, not static uh, checking, right? Not desired time. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking about uh, inferring information out of this program that a compiler could use, right? Uh, and um, so. Yeah, I think the confusion might be is that I thought you said you were going to not prescribe but describe. So I thought it was perfectly okay to say int avoid as long as you're in the the if branch, and you can determine that dynamically and then optimize x for the int to void case. And so that's perfectly good type depending on the context. You're just, so you seem to be saying now you're prescribing. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, a little, so I'm a little confused. It sounds like you're, you're, going, you're going back. So I do want to uh, infer something, some, some function type for, for x that is static because I want to compile my program, right, based because on that information. It, does it? I mean, because if we're thinking in the context of JIT, I can think of specializing it in the in the then in, in that case, I would split the variable x into two variables. Yes. Uh, so, so I don't know. It seems to be when you're just describing, it's in the eye of the beholder, and I think that's a perfectly good type as long as I'm in the then branch. So. I guess the way I understand it, you're saying that you want your description to be a sound approximation of all runtime behaviors of that. That's true. Of the, yes. of the value that you describe at the time, yes. and that if you describe it as int to void, your JIT may allocate just you know one word on yes. the stack for the argument, but yes. past point four two, it's going to yes. Die. And so. yes, and, and if you're not getting a static approximation that you can use in your in your uh, in our uh, static compiler, then then really this this there's no point in doing this exercise. So at how all. do you describe soundness formally then in your system? You're not formalizing the JIT and everything, are you? Soundness is uh, only defined to the extent that if um, if your program before inference ran for for some input, then it should continue to run uh, once you have in, once you have uh, you know inferred these types. So your these coercions that you're inserting have some runtime effect. And, yes. And if you insert yes. a so you, so you would assume that yes, uh, you would enforce uh, the static types that you just got. Uh, either uh, by by fiat by by inserting more and more coercions or uh, by breaking uh, function coercions into into you know argument coercions and return coercions at, at function calls and so and on. In this case, if you input into void and you insert a coercion around the point four two, then you would, a float to you would coercion it. would uh, fail or yeah, you change, would change, the change, change the semantics. Yes. But I think the real problem here is not is that you're getting this type here. So the least of a bound of these two functions is not int to void because type dynamic and type int are not compatible. They're completely different types and when you intersect them you get the empty type. So this, the least of a bound here is the function that takes nothing to void. And so you that's could, the yeah, so. you could, you could think of star as, as completely different type but you could also think of star as, as, a, dana as a union. Types because it, at runtime it's not compatible if you pass an int versus a block thing. It's not the same. It's that's that's an implementation detail, I would I would think. At runtime to go from an int to a dynamic thing, right? So this is why this isn't working here. So you have to be careful about your loves. Uh, you could. Uh, so. I would argue that this example would also work if you if you take uh, something else. Uh, rather than star. If you take float, then it's obvious because they're not going to get bottom, and you're not going to be able to. Continue. No, if you if you uh, if you if you take this to be a and star to be object, where a is a is some class, then this example would also work, right? So you're right, but you're partially right. Yes, star at runtime, the implementation-wise, it could be uh, thought of as as a different type, not a uh, not a super type of int, uh, but for for the purpose of this example, it is perfectly fine to think of star as a as a as a union type, and you can replace that with with other kinds of things, and and the the argument would still hold. So, are you aware of, of early work on Lisp and dynamic typing? Soft, soft typing. It's exactly the same problem. Soft so, typing. No, not soft. I mean, in some think of Hengline's work. 
Um, Heng Lang's work was, as far as I understand it, it was doing... It was doing exactly this. It was thinking of every place as a coercion from either a non-box thing to dynamic or vice versa, right? And then they would just infer things and figure out where, how to get the minimal number of coercions. And I, I have, also yeah, I have, I have to remember what the difference is. It, it's, it's certainly uh, compared in the paper uh, somewhere. Um, it, it was my understanding that they were doing uh, the the guarantee that they were shooting for is is slightly different. It's not the same guarantee. But it was more restrictive. It was not not as. Uh... Okay. So uh, going back to star now, uh, where where. Uh, you're just trying to get a solution that works uh, by by uh, taking the union of int and star, and for now assuming that star is the the union of all types, and uh, representations are uh, do not matter here. Um, what you're getting is uh, at best something that is imprecise, and at worst something that is that is potentially doing unsound reasoning. The real type that you want to infer here uh, is number to void. I would I would. Argue and number is is uh, the type that we have for double, right? Uh, the reason is that at runtime, uh, if you have to precisely capture the behaviors that were there in uh, in, in, in a program to begin with, um, at runtime all you are doing is um, is tag checking, right? So the only way where you can enforce uh, a function type uh, is by by checking that it is a function, and then um, Depending on the, the, the uses of its uh, parameters and the uses of its return type, very lazily you would you would you would um, you would enforce uh, types on the parameters and the, and the return types. So so what is important when you're trying to preserve behaviors is to look at the ways in which that function is called at runtime, because that's that's going to give you the most precise uh, uh, description of your program. Do you have a question? Some kind of escape analysis or something, right? I'll come to that. Yeah. That's perfectly true. Yep. So, uh, so uh, you know, this this is this is the type that we would we would like to have, um, and uh, we now need to formalize how we arrived at, at this. Right? Uh, th there has to be a systematic way in which you you have to derive these types. So definitely, the solution of X is is a function type. So let's split x into uh, x question mark uh, arrow x bang, where where x question mark is the type variable for for the parameter type, and x bang is the type of the return uh, value. Uh, and because uh, we want to adhere to this principle that that you want to infer everything based on inflows, because inflows are going to give you the tightest description of what is uh, how these variables are defined. Uh, we will infer both parts of of this function type based on their inflows, and f inflows of of parameter types in particular uh, correspond to function applications of of the thing that is type text. So we're going to introduce a kind for every type constructor essentially. So so you have uh, zero array type constructors like numbers and booleans and so on, but you also have functions and objects, and uh, so, so we are going to introduce this kind of pattern for for every kind of type, and uh, and then all parts of this type are going to be solved based on inflows. Okay, and this is related, very related to a notion of naive subtyping that was invented uh, by Philip Wadler and and Flin Findler a few years back. And they were also, uh, you know, studying um, gradually type systems. So it's not a big surprise that we arrived at the same more or less uh, concept from from a different angle. So if we go through this example uh, once more, uh, here uh, I'm, I'm splitting x into, into this function type, and then I'm, I'm applying the usual you know, uh, contravariant and covariant uh, rules for splitting the function types. Um, and here uh, I generate some more coercions based on the function calls, um, and eventually um, I will get um, the, the parameter type to be uh, to be number and the return type to be void. Okay. Uh, so when you're saying you're using a contravariant rule, apparently you're not, right? Because you don't care about outflows, right? Or you just not going to so, uh, ignore those in the end. 
uh, that's true, but they uh, but they could uh, they could in turn uh, you know uh, generate some more coercions, which would uh, lead to more splits and more more flows. So I'm not so the I'm only going to ignore outflows when I'm deriving the solution, not during closure closure computation. Um, the, the second to last you know that x question mark has to be less than n or flows into n. How is that used during the closure computation? And that is not used because that's that's kind of a leaf constraint. But if I see, so if it's higher order taking a function argument, yes, that's where it's yes, it. okay, yes. got it. But the, but the outflow is the inflow of something else. Yes. So so if if something else flows to an x and an x flows to an y, then I would treat this. To flow to y. That's what the closure. Yes, but I would ignore typically ignore constraints of the form x goes to a function type because uh, I might have uh, had two different things flow into x under two different conditions. So, so the thing that uh, so the additional constraint that x ha is used as a function is not that important, right? You could be reasoning outside the type system. I don't want that to influence uh, the solution. However. Uh, if there was a function type here and, and this is used as a function, it could be that I still want uh, the parameter types of this one to flow into the parameter types of that one and so on. Okay, so going back to um, you know, Nick's uh, observation, you know, let's see what, what, what happens with, with public functions here. By public function, I mean a function that is, uh, that is callable from, from a context outside your program. Okay. So uh, I'm using this notation again. Uh, parameter type of 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 a foo of foo is foo question mark, and the return type is foo bang. So we go through the motions. You you get number to number um, as as the, the the inferred types. But now you can break this program, right? So say uh, you have some external code. So so let me go through this uh, function a little bit. Uh, here you are checking a, a, a global boolean variable. And depending on that, you're either adding uh, one to x um, or, or you're returning zero. Okay, so if you set b to false and then uh, pass true to foo, you will, uh, you will go down this path um, and your program will work, right? So you're passing Boolean to, to something that was uh, explicitly dynamically typed. Uh, so it was boxed, so, so everything works here. However, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the code that, that is generated on the right, uh, this will fail very early because uh, here I'm going to try to convert a boolean to a number, uh, and that's not going to work. Yeah. A question about ActionScript. So it seems to be more strict than JavaScript. Actually, yeah. So this is this is a lie. Uh, there would be an implicit coercion here. Um, uh, so it 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 corresponds to JavaScript semantics. So this so choosing boolean here was not the right uh, thing to do. String and a number in JavaScript. Give yes, and you can you can do the same here. So, so this is this is a simplification of of ActionScript. This is, uh, is not yeah. So this, these types are, are not drawn in this Right. So we are assuming that if, if yeah all all the all the primitive types are not interconvertible and so on. But are you sort of basically talking about rewriting bytecode because you you have bytecode functions. Yes. Well. Yes. Kind of what's yes. So. More about that because. I'm just sort of missing that connection because in JavaScript, which we are accustomed to, we don't have bytecode. There's just source and execution. Yeah, sorry. So I should have made, made that connection. Yeah. So the action script uh, looks like JavaScript plus types at, at the source level, but then it's compiled by this compiler. Uh, it's a very simple compiler. Just just convert everything to bytecode, and that's how things are shipped around as as Flash applications. Yeah. And then there's a VM that that interprets this bytecode and JIT set and so on. But are you kind of thinking about, I mean, you're talking about sort of sending stuff off to runtime. Does that involve changing the bytecode? Uh, yeah, so, so this compilation phase would, would uh, be implemented in the, in the source compiler, and you would generate I different see. kinds okay, of things. OK, so it's not bytecode, 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 it's part of the compiler. Yeah. All right, so I just showed you an example why, why this inference is uh, unsound, right? And the reason is that yes, we were relying on on uh, inflows to determine our solutions, but uh, obviously here we are not uh, seeing all inflows into the parameter type of this function. 
precisely because that function is a public function. So, so of course, we cannot analyze all sorts of external code that will use this function. Yeah. Is it only public functions, or like JavaScript, does ActionScript have a higher order store? It it also has that. So I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm going to you you you're moving ahead of. of okay, uh, sorry. Uh, not sorry. So this is exactly where this this is going next. Uh, so where do we uh, not see all inflows? Um, formally, these are these are the type variables that are in the neg in negative positions in, in the type of the program. So if we think of your program as kind of a module that, ex that is exporting a lot of uh, functions and objects and so on. Uh, a public function is is um, something in in that in that module signature um, that is at the at the at the top level and and the parameter type is in a negative position in that in that type. So these types are unsafe to infer. So we have to be very careful about not trying to infer these, these types. Uh, either we require the programmer to, to provide an explicit annotation, uh, or we just infer these to be stars. So these are the kind of the roots of, of our analysis, and everything else flows from, from these things. So if you want to control these roots, you have to explicitly annotate, annotate these positions. Otherwise, we'll just want to infer star. Okay. So. Uh, However, we can do better for local functions. So this is a local function. Uh, foo is a local function now that is wrapped inside bar, and now we can we can see all calls to foo, say. Okay. So here it's perfectly sound to to infer number to number, because this function cannot be called from external code. However, then there are local functions that escape, right? So here I'm calling this function, but also also returning foo. And now if you are if you are leaking these local functions from public functions, then they are as good as public functions. Okay. So again, this is unsound now because I can construct a similar counterexample to break this code uh, with some some arbitrary context. So this would mean that perhaps we need some escape analysis, right? And this is getting more and more complicated and tedious. Uh, however, uh, fortunately, we do not need uh, an escape analysis, and that's that's one of the uh, good things about this this technique. So if you if you go through the motions and generate all the constraints in in, in the right form. Uh, then you will notice that some variable somewhere that, uh, so this is a complicated expression that says that um, I'm talking about the return type of bar, which, which is this, and the parameter type of whatever bar is returning. So if you look at this, uh, this code bar is returning a function, and uh, this is the, the parameter type of, of the function that is being returned. And uh, by a rules that that is in a negative position in the type of the program, um, and because it's in, it's in a negative position now, because we we have set up our our um, our uh, floor, um, uh, you know, the thing that Tom was talking about, right? Two function types, the parameters are flowing back and forth. This this thing, uh, by by annotating this as star or inferring this as star, this this will flow back. Um, some more constraints, and eventually you will you will infer the parameter type of of foo to be uh, to be star. So this is this is safe, right? So we do not end up inferring uh, the parameter type to be number because that would be unsound. So this is a good thing because this does not add any any more weight to uh, to the system. The system re uh, remains pretty lightweight. You just have to have a position based restriction on the type of the program. Plus uh, some sound rules for closure computation, and, and that suffices. Okay. So objects are, are similar. Uh, you 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 have potentially unsound results if you if you don't take into account things that escape. Um, so it turns out that writable fields of objects escape via the constructor. So you, this, they have to be treated as, yeah. So you're assuming that the type structure is actually finite of your of your code. Otherwise, you can't do this kind of expansion. So what? Can't you write functions that take an arbitrary number of arbitrary argument type functions? Uh, I, I would not go into uh, inferring the types of those those functions. Well, I mean, if you just run this algorithm, you will never terminate because you will constantly build up bigger and bigger functions. Right? You will keep splitting a variable into the bang version and the, qu the question version, and then recursively figure out, oh, the question mark is again a bang and the question mark, and so on and so on. So uh, the rules terminate because there are, there are so at every step um, of, of the closure computation, something is going down. 
Um, we, we guarantee that and there's, there's a proof uh, in, in the paper uh, to that effect. Because I mean, if, clearly your rule is that if you have some, if you have some function flowing into a type verb, right? You have to split the type verb, right? Yes. So the, uh, the, the, during the closure computation, right? Yes. You have to prove that you're not going to split them indefinitely, right? So, uh, so in, in typical f transitive, so we do not compute a full transitive closure. Um, again, I would, I would refer uh, you to the paper to, to see this. Um, what happens is that um, because f um, these x's are only split into uh, their shapes, and the shapes determine how how things flow across um, you know functions. So so if, if if there's a function type that goes to an x and that x goes to a fun another function type, you first split that x into into x question mark and x bang, and the flows go through that. And uh, you stop when you, you you have mismatch on the on the two sides. Uh, so it's it's kind of stunted. You don't take uh, eager cross products across uh, across type variables, which is also why we we have uh, one order less than uh, the usual running type. Uh, our, our running type is not n cube is n squared. Because take the y combinator, okay? JavaScript, you can write the y combinator, right? There's nothing that prevents you that. And that guy has an infinite size type if you're trying to expand it. So I do not see how how you're getting around this problem if you're trying to type these these programs using this type structure, I don't see how you do it. Uh, can we go through that, yeah, that example this offline? offline. This, this doesn't seem right. OK. OK. Um, I, I, can, I can more or less guarantee that we will stop early and, uh, and, and assume, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll go through the rules to, to see that. So the time complexity of this algorithm is n square rather than the usual bound of n cube. Uh, this is precisely because we do not take a full transitive closure, and we are kind of clever in, in the way we uh, terminate um, transitive closures. Okay, um, and we prove that um, this this preserves the runtime semantics. Programs do not break, and they can be composed with external code. All right. Uh, so uh, in order to evaluate this, uh, so this is a very early evaluation. We later implemented this uh, in the in the Ashton compiler. So so the results that I'm showing are are old results, uh, where we we ran this through a, a bunch of benchmarks and um, and we we uh, so this this is how we set set the experiments up. We have fully typed uh, versions of of these benchmarks. We also have. Um, uh, what what we uh, call partially typed benchmarks, which are uh, basically we take the fully typed benchmarks and we only retain the annotations that are required for for our analysis, which is uh, annotations at the ne at negative positions, and then we run run this algorithm, and uh, on an average we 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 had a lot of improvement over over these programs, uh, and in many benchmarks we actually uh, recovered 100 percent performance of the fully typed benchmarks. So uh, the promise here is that you can leave out these types and still get the uh, uh, performance as if you, you fully annotated your programs. And in some cases, you also get better than fully typed benchmarks because uh, we, we managed to infer something that is more precise and more compact than, uh, than the annotation that, that we had. Uh, in some cases, we are, we are hopelessly uh, bad. For example, for array reads, uh, you really can't guarantee anything out of uh, that comes out of uh, an actual script array, which is more or less like a JavaScript array. Yeah. I'm also surprised by your benchmark selection. These are, I mean, not only are these relatively small, uh, these are also fairly numeric in nature, which is not entirely common if you look at client-side JavaScript. And there are benchmarks in the V8 suite that are fairly different from like Richards and Raytrace. So what's like if I were to run this in jQuery, what would come out? Uh, that would be possibly the uh, the subject of the next part of the talk. Okay. So this, uh, so here we are we are focusing more or less on game like action script programs, which uh, which are uh, either fully typed to begin with, 
um, and use a lot of numerics and so on. And they are not, uh, they don't use a lot of prototype chains and, and lots of dynamic constructs that JavaScript has. Uh, those things do exist in ActionScript as a subset, but most people use the class, you know, the classes in ActionScript and that, that kind of subset, which is better behaved than, than full JavaScript. Is the JavaScript programs ported to, to ActionScript yeah, so these, and then annotated with the types? So these are part of the, the ActionScript VM uh, benchmarks, which evolved from being a JavaScript VM to an ActionScript VM. So these benchmarks still exist there. Yes, and some of these have actually been ported to use classes instead of objects and so on. Um, we also don't do well with uh, numbers versus integers, but some range analysis can improve that. Okay, uh, how, how are we doing on time? Okay, all right. So, uh, so in summary, uh, you know, uh, this this is a technique that improves the performance of um, of of existing Flash applications. Uh, and the key idea here was to in, uh, consider only inflows for our solutions, uh, and infer solutions by parts for higher order types. Um, and uh, this is backward compatible, and uh, the way to do that would, is is only by having a very lightweight restriction on uh, the the types that we can infer or the parts of types that we can infer, and uh, uh, an escape analysis that seems necessary for for this analysis is actually not necessary because it's encoded by uh, the way we compute flows. Okay, so this is fine, but um, but as we will see, um, as we move to, to uh, the second way in which dynamically typed code appears, uh, not everything can be solved through static analysis. In particular, if you're deliberately trying to go outside the type system, uh, there are ways in which you can uh, break uh, the static analysis uh, very soon. But we would still need static typing, uh, I claim. And there are many reasons to, to desire static typing in, in these languages. Uh, I would want to check for type errors over all paths and keep documentation synchronized. Uh, I also want to ease uh, code maintenance um, uh, and, and know how to call, uh, call functions. Uh, of course, I want efficient implementations, and, and that's, uh, that's, also, that's, that's always um, there. Okay. Uh, so the kind of static analysis that I just just described uh, fails miserably when you when you throw very dynamic constructs uh, at, at at it, right? In particular, things like eval and prototypes just don't go very well with uh, with the kind of static analysis I showed. It's also true that a lot of libraries use these dynamic constructs. Essentially, they do a lot of meta programming with with the dynamic language, um, and libraries could highly benefit from types. So it turns out that the kind of code that would um, would defeat static analysis would benefit the most with uh, with uh, you know inferred types. Now the idea behind uh, this this second piece of the talk is that uh, we can we can do dynamic analysis for for these kinds of programs, and uh, the saving grace is that dynamic programs come with lots of tests. So can we exploit these tests for doing precise analysis? by observing only the feasible paths uh, through your program, and then trying to abstract uh, whatever obs observations we make uh, by generalizing these types and predicting type errors. Okay. So this is uh, a, a small function that we'll uh, use as a running example. Uh, I'm switching notation here because this, was, this is a different paper. We used different notations just to keep uh, notation uh, consistent with that paper. Um, here, um, I, I have uh, things called alpha, which, which denote type variables. Um, so there, you have a formal argument x, and the type variable for that, for that formal argument is, is alpha x. There's also a corresponding uh, type variable for the return type of bar. So the key idea behind this dynamic analysis, so, so what, what are we trying to do? We are going to take a program, and we are going to instrument it to, to observe things uh, as, as it's running. So the, one of the key concepts here is one of wrapping a value. Uh, let's say that a value v is something that you have at runtime. There's also a wrapped value, which is also a, a value at runtime, um, which is 
a value v wrapped with some type variable. So you can think of this wrapped value as some, some sort of proxy that more or less behaves as v, but it also carries along uh, the, this type variable with it. So type variables uh, express some, some static invariance, and the values wrapped with these type variables are, are carrying these static invariance. And we are, make, we are going to make sure that, uh, that this, this wrapping has some meaning. So there, uh, there are two dual operations here, one of constraining and one of wrapping. So uh, how does this work? So let's look at this code. Uh, you start with, uh, with this call here to bar with a new instance of C. Um, so you create an, uh, an object of type C, uh, and this now flows to X, the, the parameter of bar. So X now contains this object. So I, I insert uh, this, this constraint now, which says that uh, the type of whatever x contains has to be a subtype of alpha x, which is the, the, the type parameter for x. And because x at runtime actually uh, uh, contains a c here, I'm going to uh, insert that coercion, c, uh, c to alpha x. Okay. The next step is now to wrap this this object. Uh, so so recall that we are we are at the entry point of bar. We have just uh, inserted a coercion, uh, so, uh, emitted a coercion. Now we are going to wrap this value that that just came in with this abstract type alpha x. So the reason we are doing this is that we now want need to uh, want to monitor wherever this this uh, parameter is flowing, and we want to capture the fact that this is typed alpha x, so that. Uh, subsequent uh, constraints that we generate are constraining alpha x rather than the concrete type of C. So this is uh, this uh, becomes important because in the next step we are calling foo, and then we insert uh, we emit a coercion that says that x has to accept a method uh, a, a foo method. Okay. Um, and the type of uh, the x now node is alpha x because we have just wrapped this uh, this value with alpha x so the type of uh, that that value is now this abstract type alpha then we uh, then we uh, go to the return uh, value which is 7 and we again emit a uh, coercion that says type of 7 is the type of the return value um, again that's concrete uh, up to this point but in the next step um, we we wrap this value with with the type parameter, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the type variable that denotes the return type of bar, um, and from that point on, uh, we will track how this how this value flows uh, flows out, right? So the return uh, value that comes out of bar will go to y, and from that point on, it will it will cap uh, it will it will carry this invariant that it came from the return um, uh, return of bar. Something that's already wrapped would happen. Yes, yes, you you can you can double wrap. That's the next slide. So uh, so these are the subtyping constraints that you generate, right? And this is the picture that you were alluding to, right? So so you have so th this is uh, this is more or less how how uh, things look at runtime or could look. You have a value that is wrapped by an alpha x, that's wrapped by an alpha by y, and so on. Now the thing that to note is that we always constrain and wrap at the same time. So when we when we con when we wrapped v with alpha x, we also did constrain the type of v to be a subtype of alpha x. The next time we we wrap it with alpha y, we say that alpha x, which is a type of the wrapped value, is a subtype of alpha y. And the next time we wrap, we do the same. So this is this is kind of a chain of things that that we would generate, and that's the meaning of wrapping essentially. Now it's also true that you can optimize this and and just keep around one one level of wrapping, right? So, uh, so this is a summary of, of what happens at, at a function call. Say we have a function mx with body e and uh, it's called with, with a value u. Um, we constrain the argument, wrap the argument, then we evaluate the body, we constrain the return and wrap the return. Okay. And this is how um, you know, the program instruments itself and, and uh, carries on, uh, you know, carry, carrying essentially these, these type variables as, as the types of most values in the program as it runs. So uh, once, we, once we finish our execution with some test, 
we would uh, get these system of constraints and uh, we can find most general solutions for these things. Uh, how we solve this is not important in this, this work because uh, again, you can, you can take a transitive closure and uh, this time we decided to, to infer, uh, try to infer some polymorphic types. So we uh, treat, uh, so we take both uh, lower bounds as well as upper bounds uh, into consideration and we try to infer uh, polymorphic types for, for, uh, for functions. Uh, to some extent, Th these are not most general, uh, you know, the best, best polymorphic types that you can infer. Uh, and it's a fruitless exercise anyway. Do most general types exist? No, they don't exist. So, so we're trying to, so, so we have a pattern that we, we try to satisfy, which is first um, infer the return types in terms of the parameter types and then generalize the pattern, uh, uh, you know, uh, the parameter types. Uh, as far as possible for fields, it's, it's unambiguous which one to do. So we pick uh, one, we pick the lower bounds and so on. And we also check for consistency in this one. So, so we actually check whether the outflows um, um, are, you know, correspond to, um, um, so, so we actually check whether, whether the outflows um, are, are consistent. And this gives us some type errors, so we can we can suggest to the programmer that maybe your program is uh, is is not well typed. Um, so the the good features of this uh, is is what I want to focus on, uh, which is uh, one is path sensitivity. So so if you are deliberately trying to go outside the type system, you may have code like this, which under some conditions you treat something as an integer, and some other conditions you you treat some the same thing as as uh, as a, as a string. A standard static type inference would completely get confused because it could it would see that. Uh, there's, there's a potential for, for an integer being, being uh, used as a string. So you would give an unsatisfiable uh, you know, constraint system, um, and so you would, you would say that this doesn't work. However, if you, if you look closely, this, this actually corresponds to an infeasible path. Uh, because if P holds, then we, in this program, we consistently use it as an integer, and if P does not hold, then, then we use it as a string. So the dynamic type inference technique that I just talked about will will actually not not go uh, you know not not be stuck with with this um, with this inconsistency. Um, so we would go go down one of the paths and things would be completely consistent down that path. In in another test, we might go down a different consistent path and the constraints that would, we would generate would be also consistent. So if, eventually we would we would infer something uh, like Boolean to number for this function, which is exactly the type you want. Uh, one might think that um, you would need uh, like uh, an exponential, uh, uh, you, uh, there would be an exponential blow up in, in the path coverage that is required um, for this for this to work. However, we, we, because we are doing a, a, a modular analysis for every function, we have a, a, a type parameter and a, and a return value, and we are not doing you know like interprocedural uh, analysis. Um, we we kind of contain the path, uh, the path coverage that is required. So here we have two functions, and uh, potentially you would think that there are four paths to be uh, covered here. However, with one test, you could con cover. Uh, one side of that branch. With another test, you might cover the remaining, uh, 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 you know, remaining parts, and that's that's sufficient for soundness. Uh, again, uh, by by some definition of soundness that I'll, that I'll talk about informally here. Further tests are redundant, so they are not driving your program through through different paths, um, and so so this is good because. Um, what we're doing here is dealing with type variables rather than concrete types, and that kind of generalizes the observations a little bit, so that uh, you don't need uh, an exponential number of ta uh, tests to, to cover all paths in your program. You may not cover many paths ever, right? In, That's in true. Real program. In particular, if, 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 if those paths are infeasible, up. then you would not cover them. You may not also cover some paths that are feasible but, but are not tested. Yeah, so that that's a price to that's a price to pay for for this. Uh, sorry, random numbers you said. Right, like if the random number is one point two, then yeah, you know, do this. Yes. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, so that, there's so there's a caveat there. Of course, you're not going to potentially cover some parts. However, the the, the coverage that we require is here is uh, sort of very abstract coverage. It, it, it's fine to cover the control flow graph of your program to some extent, and the soundness guarantee that we will get. Of course, this you know you can't even think about soundness in this this uh, inference, right? So we managed to prove something that is a qualified uh, soundness theorem, which says that if your subsequent uh, executions follow the abstract paths that you covered through your testing tr during your testing phase or training phase, then uh, then you would be fine. So the generalization that we do is sound, but you're not you don't get an absolute soundness guarantee. What do you mean by the abstract paths? You only observe concrete paths. Uh, concrete paths, but the information that we generate on the side, the constraints that we generate are abstract, right? Because we did these, this this wrapping of these concrete values with these type variables, so the const so the constraints that we ge uh, generate are involve these type variables for the most part. Which means that, you know, uh, if if we exercise both paths here, for example, right, we will get some uh, very general constraint about the parameter type uh, of of bar. Uh, and the two uses that correspond to the two uh, types, right? So, so we will uh, the type that we'll infer for the parameter type of bar would cover those two abstract uses in terms of how they were used. Yeah. Because you keep yeah, I don't know what coverage, but, but obviously you're not covering paths. Yeah, so some do, so do you mean edge coverage? Maybe, yeah. No, I don't know exactly what terminology. So in, in this example, you had two paths. Yeah, edge coverage is what I meant. Okay, yeah. okay but that's what yeah, yeah, yeah. But your sound uh, is saying that if you follow the path, exactly the paths that you saw in your trust in your training phase, then your types are sound for those paths. But if in this case, for example, I went left first and then right. Yeah, I should have said edges probably. That's that was uh, so. Uh, we in inside inside a function, I do mean uh, that you need to cover all paths, though. Not just edge coverage. Yeah, inside a function. So this is across functions. You can you can mix and match uh, paths across functions, but in yeah. So in in the, in the size of in, in the size of uh, individual methods, this is still exponential. You can do whatever you want to do, right? So you can uh, you can potentially just exercise one path through a program and, and your soundness theorem will then hold for just, just that path. Uh, fields are, uh, obviously they can propagate state across, uh, across functions. So they can, uh, you can trivially break this technique with, uh, with fields if you don't, if you're not careful. In particular, this, this is an example that uh, where uh, you can assign both a string uh, and, and an integer to a field at different times, and if you have just the right sequence of, of calls in your in your testing phase, you would potentially infer something that is unsound, right? In, you would infer the field to be uh, an integer here because you called bar, then quarks, then foo, which means that you 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 wrote an integer and you used it as an integer. Again, this this plus is not polymorphic in this example. Right? Um, however, uh, you can then break the program uh, with a subsequent test that uh, that you know still uh, the, the the execution path remains in the in the set of paths that were covered, but um, you're still not typable. Right? So uh, the solution, of course, is to to constrain raft fields as well. So you have to intercept field reads and writes just like you intercept uh, method calls and returns. So you can think of every field. Uh, read and write as uh, an accessor call. Um, so this is the soundness theorem that we have, which is uh, if the tests cover all feasible paths per method, then the inferred types are sound uh, for all executions. You can weaken this, you can qualify this by coverage by saying that uh, as long as executions fall under uh, the abstract paths uh, through your program, uh, the inferred types will be sound. Uh, another observation that we did, uh, that we made uh, when implementing and testing this is that um, most most types turned out to be path insensitive. So uh, even when we did not have full coverage, we man we we uh, inferred types that that were still correct. 
Uh, so the, does this, this is, yeah. Good question on this. So because a lot of these operations are polymorphic, right? So plots, for example, um, isn't it the case that even if you cover all paths of a function, what you really need to cover is all paths even of the polymorphic operators, and that yes. seems much harder to actually achieve, right? That's true. Yeah, so so we when when we did this work, this was in, done in the context of Ruby, and uh, f from that point on, I, I you know we didn't rethink this in terms of uh, JavaScript. I think uh, many more problems need to be solved in order to apply this to JavaScript. But does the Ruby have overloaded algorithms? Yes, but for overload, uh, it 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 has classes. And we added some more rules that would check consistency of overrides, right? Just like you would do in any most uh, class-based languages. So that got rid of the problem for Ruby. Uh, when you when you have arbitrary inheritance chains, then then it's harder to to see how how that works. How, however, you could you could do it, right? You made some more assumptions. All right, so. Uh, so one of the cool things about the implementation, which I uh, I'm not very proud of, but but uh, it may seem cool to some people, is that um, because Ruby is highly dynamic, you can you can use itself to to instrument uh, itself. So the uh, so the implementation was metacircular. You didn't need to uh, you you could you didn't need uh, like a whole static analysis to set up a whole static analysis framework to implement this, and a similar thing could could be done in JavaScript as well. Uh, probably after solving so, some other problems. So because we were using Ruby to instrument itself, there was a lot of proxies being generated, so, so this was slow, but of course this is not going to be the program that you will ultimately run. Uh, you're just going to use this to infer types and that's, that's going to be a one-time thing uh, probably. Uh, but most of the types that we inferred were, were correct, uh, even though we did not have full coverage in, in most of these, for most of these programs. We also managed to find a type error. It's kind of interesting, anyway. Okay, um, so um, so in conclusion, um, we have static analysis and we have dynamic analysis. And uh, as I mentioned, we're just starting, uh, getting started on um, JavaScript. Uh, and I think that a combination of both techniques would be necessary, and this is almost like a tautology, I don't want to like, uh, take take ownership of this idea. Of course, uh, on the static analysis end, um, especially with tooling, because Adobe is a tooling company, we don't we, we are not in the web browser business. We don't want to analyze any JavaScript that you want to throw to us. We can we can make your JavaScript programs run through our tools and you know check for uh, errors uh, early on and force you to write in certain um, ways and so on. Uh, we can imagine that static analysis would be would be very fruitful. Uh, there are more and more sophisticated analysis that we can use. Uh, uh, so one one particularly interesting one is uh, Dimitrius Vardulakis's work on uh, CFA2, uh, and he's probably trying to in, uh, introduce that to the Google Closure compiler. Um, and this seems to work pretty well, especially with JavaScript programs. Some some benchmarks that use uh, that set up inheritance hierarchies using prototypes, but they, they are not crazy programs. They, they are dynamic programs, but uh, they, they kind of stabilize after a while. Um, uh, CFA2 works uh, pretty well for, for those kinds of programs. Uh, dynamic analysis can fill in the gaps. It's actually used in a very, uh, very rudimentary form uh, in, in most JITs today, right? Uh, so most JITs work, uh, JavaScript JITs work by, um, by, by running a program for a while. Um, and, and based on the profiles that, that you generate, you speculate on types. So there's, there's uh, hope that uh, the kind of dynamic type inference uh, technique that, that I just talked about could be used to generalize uh, those, those profiles. There's also the view that dynamic checks can always um, you know, support uh, unsound static analysis, and this is the subject of Brian Hackett's work in Firefox, where um, uh, his argument is that um, JavaScript is just too too hard to do static analysis on, sound static analysis on, but that does not mean that you cannot do uh, unsound yet useful static analysis, and then 
you know uh, add enough um, checks uh, to to support that unsound analysis. Uh, future directions that that uh, I'm looking at uh, one one direction that is particularly interesting is um, whether you can um, compile JavaScript ahead of time. Uh, as I said, we we have tools. We can force people to write uh, programs in certain ways, uh, but um, uh, but it would be really cool if if you could force people to uh, or or have people uh, write games in JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript is a nice functional programming language if you think about it. It's not very crazy. Um, some people completely hate it, but I think. Uh, if if you just use the functions and records part of of JavaScript, it's actually not that bad, and most games are written in that form uh, anyway. So um, so the idea behind this project is uh, can we can we do the same things, same kinds of things that uh, that a typical JavaScript JIT would do, but only broaden the scope of of uh, this this speculation. So so typical JITs uh, speculate and add guards all over the place. If you do some uh, more or less stat uh, sound static analysis, uh, you can eliminate many of the guards and you can pull up the checks early on so that uh, you can pre-specialize functions to, uh, to either go down a slow path or a, front, uh, or a fast path very early on. So that's, that's some of the ideas that we are exploring in that project. The other, pro uh, the other idea which I don't know anything uh, about how, how that's going to pan out is, uh, as I said, to uh, try to apply uh, this dynamic type inference technique uh, to generalize the kind of speculation that you do in JITs. Uh, and I'll be happy to brainstorm or collaborate there. Okay. So, um, I mean, I think you'll stick around and we'll go to lunch, right? Yep. So if you have questions, feel free to uh, engage.